All right, FTMI, go ahead. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, and first and foremost, I want to express my thanks and gratitude uh, to our Bronx Borough President Vanessa L. Gibson and her office ultimately for the support that they have provided in really helping put this together and lead um, ultimately of convening uh, the Bronx Clergy Task Force um, and overall residents and community leaders across the board of really providing this forum to spread uh, fire safety prepared and emergency preparedness education. Uh, again, throughout this last month, the Bronx and, and the city itself and the world witnessed the tragedy firsthand with what occurred on East 181st Street. And again, from the department standpoint and from the FDNY, our sympathy uh, and our prayers and, 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 and thoughts go out to the community itself and the borough as a whole in terms of the Bronx. Uh, we are here to continue supporting through education and prevention through emergency response. And again, we just want to thank everyone for joining this evening, not only to listen and to learn a little bit more about uh, the curriculum that we provide, but also to discuss in which ways we can take this curriculum and as a community work together to really promote um, and strengthen fire prevention and emergency preparedness education and training. Um, again, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the, the, the Bronx Borough President uh, and her leadership ultimately in convening this and always being a, an advocate and a supporter uh, for the fire department. Um, and without further ado, uh, as this is the Bronx Borough President's event, I would like for the Madam President to provide opening remarks and welcome. Madam Thank President. you so much, Captain, and good evening, everyone, to all who are joined together for our virtual faith-based fire safety education training tonight. Welcome. Good evening to each and every one of you, to those that are watching live on social media. I am Bronx Borough President Vanessa L. Gibson, and I am so grateful that all of you chose to spend some time with us this evening for a very important topic, fire education and fire safety. Uh, we have been reminded over the last several weeks of the importance of making sure that New Yorkers and Bronxites are as trained as much as possible on disaster preparedness and in the event of an unfortunate fire. And as your Bronx Borough President, it is my responsibility to make sure that we continue to collaborate with our first responders at the FDNY and the American Red Cross and the Office of Emergency Management, as well as all of our partners at the community level. Our faith-based organizations and the Bronx Clergy Task Force has truly been doing great work. Our clergy leaders recognize the role that each of them plays in this part and in this work, and I'm so grateful that the Bronx Clergy Task Force uh, has co-hosted and convened tonight's very important forum. I want to recognize my team who is on tonight's call and thank them for their help in bringing all of us together. Our Director of Community Services, Tracy McDermott, everyone knows Tracy, and our Director of Constituent Services, Marisol Halpern, everyone knows Marisol. And to each and every one of you who are joined together again, thank you so much. January 9th, exactly one month ago, our borough was faced with a horrific five alarm residential fire in the Fordham Heights community at Twin Parks Northwest. A 120 unit development of working class community members and many of our local residents and neighbors. And unfortunately, due to this tragic fire, we lost 17 neighbors, nine adults and eight children. And we continue to mourn the loss of our neighbors. We continue to send our condolences and our prayers to all of the families that have been impacted by this devastating fire at Twin Parks. One month later, we continue to work on the ground with the elected officials and with all of our community partners to make sure that residents of Twin Parks know that they are not alone, know that we are here to work with them to provide the support, the counseling, uh, all of the services around permanent housing and relocation efforts. And we wanna thank everyone, the Bronx Clergy Task Force, all of our clergy leaders, community-based organizations, many of our leaders in the Muslim community. We want to thank all of our imams and so many across the Bronx and the city of New York for the overwhelming expressions of love and so much support that families at Twin Parks have received. Even though we recognize the cause of this particular fire, we will not stop on the education work. 
We have to continue to train residents and, and talk to our families about what they can do in the event of a fire. And I also recognize that on a separate note, but very important, we have to work with building managers and owners and landlords across the Bronx to make sure that they are being held accountable and providing the services that every resident in this borough should have. Safe, decent, quality, affordable housing with heat and hot water and self-closing doors and fire alarms and smoke alarms that are functional. That is our primary goal. And so even in the middle of pain, we will find purpose and we're going to learn from what has happened and prevent as many fires as we can from ever happening. And even as we saw that fire on January 9th, a week later, we had a building explosion in the Longwood community that claimed the life of a 77 year old neighbor. And that was due to a gas explosion. And so all of the work we do not only helps tenants and residents, but homeowners as well. And so I want to again, thank everyone for all of your support and just showing so much love for families in need. We understand that at any given time, we ourselves could be a victim of a fire, living in apartment buildings, living in homes, through no fault of our own, it could happen to us. And so tonight's forum is a chance to learn what can we do better? What can we do to improve the system? How can we work together to make sure that we help to educate everyone on what we can do in the event of a fire? So tonight you're going to hear from the FDNY as well as the American Red Cross. We're going to learn about developing and planning escape routes in the event that residents don't know about escape uh, options within their building, whether it's a stairwell or a fire escape. We're going to talk about identifying if your particular building is fireproof or non-fireproof, and also the importance of having a maintained and operable working smoke alarm and carbon monoxide detector. We're also going to talk about electrical and kitchen safety tips because we know many fires are caused in the kitchen and are electrical in nature. And also this is the season of winter. It's very cold outside. We know that many families that are not given sufficient heat are using other options like space heaters. So we just wanna make sure that if you are choosing to use a space heater, you're doing so in a safe way. So winter fire safety tips is also a topic of discussion for tonight. And so again, I wanna thank the members of the Bronx Clergy Task Force, all of our community leaders and community residents who have joined us tonight. And I encourage you to share this information. It is counterproductive if we receive all this great information from the fire department, as well as American Red Cross, and we don't share it with loved ones, with neighbors, with our members of our churches, so many different audiences that we have access to. Please help us share this information. The work does not end here. We definitely need everyone's help. And I asked everyone to actively partner with the FDNY's education unit and the American Red Cross in your own church, in your own community. You can host your own fire safety training for members of your houses of worship or your community or civic organizations. But tonight you will hear about how you can go about doing your part to make the Bronx a better and safer place to live. Again, I wanna thank the staff. I want to thank again, the FDNY first responders always on the ground. Thank you so much for responding. We also had another fire this past weekend in University Heights, and we have several families that have been displaced as a result of that. And so we're working with those families as well. But once again, thank you, Bronx Clergy Task Force. I now want to recognize our president of the Bronx Clergy Task Force and ask for him to make some opening remarks. I turn this over to Bishop Angelo Rosario. Thank you. Honorable Borough President Vanessa Gibson, I know that you have had a hard start. Everything has come full circle, but I believe that in my faith, God has given you the ability to be able to meet the challenges. And I pray that all of us that are on here, that we come together as a family from different houses of worship, whether a Muslim brotherhood, our Imams, our Hindu brothers, our Catholic churches, our Baptist Pentecostals, all people of faith that are also living upon the face of the earth, especially in the Bronx, that 
we know that these problems exist. This is part of our human life and human work, and we thank God for the SDMY for their ability to be able to have a heart to be able to help our communities. Um, I reached out to some of our communities in Riverdale with our Jewish Brotherhood to be able to create programs over there. I spoke here in Co-op City to management to create something in management here so that we could have uh, seminars and classes here also. I spoke to our Concord Village to cross over to create these programs that are very well needed before an accident, before a fire could occur that we could try to bring forward the teaching that we need. Uh, I heard uh, our, our borough president speak about gas lines. We had a couple of problems here in Cross City with gas lines that I believe need to be inspected. If there's a smell with gas, how do we deal with it and not probably throw on a light switch or things like that, but we'll hear a lot of the stuff in the clergy that is on and those other organizations because this is not only about clergy, it's about all of us so that we could come together and we could help our borough president do the work that she wants to be able to do, be able to make our borough a greater borough. And that I believe that that would extend out to the outer borough or boroughs also so that they may be able to receive the same benefit that we have. But we start here in the Bronx because this is our backyard. And there's a verse that says, first from Jerusalem, then to Samaria, then to the end of the world. Jerusalem is first here, your home, and then Samaria, the outside, the cousins, and then everybody else. So again, I want to thank you, uh, Borough President Vanessa Gibson, for putting this together. This is very needed, and I pray that it's not only a one-time shot, that we will do it every two or three months across the ball. Again, peace and blessings to each and every one of us, and I excuse Sheikh Jarama Musa because he's had another meeting as we speak, and he's also been dealing with the problem with our brotherhood in the Muslim a fire that, that came out, so he's very involved, and he's the vice president of the Bronx Cray Task Force, and I just want to shout him out. So peace and love to each and every one of us and to each one of the Bronx Cray Task Force members that are here today. Thank you, Vanessa. Peace and blessings. Thank you so much, Bishop. We appreciate your leadership and everything you've done. And certainly to our brother, Sheikh Musa. I know he's always busy running around and I certainly want to acknowledge him. I want to acknowledge Bishop Nancy and Osadio as well. I uh, thank you all for your leadership. I now want to turn it over to receive opening remarks uh, on behalf of the Islamic Leadership Council of New York. Uh, we have Lamia Kandakar. Are you here with us? Just a quick reminder in case anyone is connected by phone, uh, if you do okay. need to speak, uh, just hit star six to unmute if you're on a phone. If you're using a computer or tablet or uh, smartphone, you can unmute just hitting the uh, the microphone icon in WebEx. So just, just a general reminder in case that helps. Okay. Do you know if she's with us? She she may be uh she may not be coming on tonight. She she didn't know for sure if she was gonna be able to make it now. She just oh okay, no problem. Okay, so then we can go right into the uh FDNY fire safety training. Uh Captain, are you ready? I am, Madam President. Uh, uh thank you very much for having us. Uh my name is Captain Michael Kozo. I'm with the FDNY Fire Safety Education Unit. And uh again, I just want to thank everybody for having us here. And we definitely want to get this message across to everybody. Not only now, as a result of this uh, fire, but just in general, this is something that we should be going over constantly uh, and something that I want uh, to make sure everybody takes home at least at, at the very least one message, uh, if not more. So uh, just so we're aware of a few statistics that are going on right now. Um, last year in 2021, we uh, finished out the year with about 73 fire fatalities in New York City, uh, where we were at a about 66 in 2020. So we did uh, go up quite a bit. Uh, right now in New York City, we're at 22. Uh, we just had two fatalities in a fire uh, a couple days ago. So 
uh, again, it's a it's a bad start to the year, and uh, we're hoping that these messages that we're getting out to everybody do make a difference uh, somewhat. So what I do plan to do is to share my screen, and I'm going to go over a PowerPoint. Uh, I'm not going to be reading through the PowerPoint, but it is uh, the slides are going to be what I am talking about so that everybody uh, can read and also hear at the same time what I am talking about. So I'm going to go over to that PowerPoint now. Okay, so those are the three things that we talk about. We talk about prevention, early detection, and planning, and those are the that's the order that I'm going to go in uh, for my presentation. Uh, so here are the statistics we were, we were discussing. All right, and the top three causes of fire fatalities in 2020 were electrical, smoking, and cooking. Smoking still seems to be the number one cause of fires nationwide. A few more statistics, just uh, most fires do occur between 12 midnight and 8 a.m. when most people are sleeping. We do see a huge number of fires in the kitchen uh, or bedroom. And of course, fires are occurring more during the colder winter months. Uh, and those are all things that we are gonna go over today uh, th throughout this presentation. So what contributes to the likelihood of a fatal fire victim? So what's making uh, these people more likely to die in a fire? Well, not having an operable or audible smoke alarm uh, is the number one thing. Uh, and again, something I will go over in a, in a little bit more detail, but they say that having a working smoke alarm reduces your chances of dying in a fire by 50%. And uh, over 70% of people that are dying in fires today do not have a working smoke alarm. So uh, the statistics talk for themselves. Uh, so having the working smoke alarms does save lives. Uh, not having an evacuation response, so uh, attempting to fight the fire, right? And I will go over briefly the small window that you will have to try and put out a fire before that fire is beyond your control. Re-entering the fire building, we see uh, a little bit. Again, obviously, once you get out, you stay out. You should not be re-entering the building no matter what. And we tell children that all the time. Uh, having a, a practice, uh, practicing and developing in a fire escape plan is definitely something that we go over constantly in the schools. Children know exactly how to get out of the school if there's a fire or if the alarms go off. When we ask them the same question at home, they almost look at us with a blank stare as if they've never practiced it or gone over that before. Uh, so that is something that we are trying to work on so that they know exactly how to get out of their homes just as easily as they know how to get out of their school. Blocked and inaccessible escape routes. Uh, we have noticed furniture and uh, items blocking people's access to their windows leading to the fire escapes. We've also seen locks, padlocks on the fire escape window, uh, making it very difficult for somebody to access that window should they need to in an emergency. So we're gonna get into it. The leading cause of fires, fire injuries is unattended cooking. And that is what we're seeing in the kitchen. What is happening? I understand that we're all trying to multitask and, and all of that, um, but Unfortunately, cooking can't be one of those things that we're trying to do at the same time with other things. I know we're trying to help children with the homework. We want to take a shower. We're trying to answer the phone. We're watching TV, answering the door. Unfortunately, we can't do all of that and still have food cooking on the stove. And that's what's happening. So again, uh, we have a few sayings. Um, st um, stand by your pan. Uh, keep an eye on what you fry. You know, Choose your saying, but we want you to stay in the kitchen while you are cooking. Do not leave the kitchen for any reason. If you have to, I mean, absolutely must leave the kitchen. A few things we do recommend, set a, a short alarm on your phone or um, a timer to let you know, um, you know that you did walk away from the kitchen, you need to get back in there, put your oven mitt on if you're gonna walk out of the kitchen. You're not gonna get very far with the oven mitt before you do realize that you are cooking. So just a brief uh, reminder that you are cooking if you must leave the kitchen. Uh, obviously, we want to heat oils gradually, and this goes back to the same concept, right? We're in a rush. We're trying to do everything at the same time. We want to hurry up and cook, and people are throwing that flame on as high as they can. You don't want to do that. You want to heat those oils as slowly as you can. Keep the position of the pot handles in mind, and we do see this often. People will keep the pot handles hanging off the out the edge of the stove, and what happens? You're trying to do five things at the same time. You're not paying attention. You're on the phone. Next thing you know, you turn around quick and you knock into the handle that tips over the pot 
and you're getting burned, the oils are getting all over you, a child may reach up and grab the handle, now they're burning themselves. So we wanna keep those handles facing towards the, uh, in, towards the rear of the stove, if possible. Uh, our senior population, we are seeing a bit of this. Uh, what they're doing is they're actually lighting themselves on fire while they're cooking, because what they're wearing, uh, we've noticed there's a lot of heavy, uh, you know, sweatshirts and baggy and the robes and stuff like that. And what happens is as they're reaching over the stove, their clothes are catching fire. So again, something you want to keep in mind, short sleeves, tight fitted clothing when you are cooking uh, to avoid that contact from happening. Obviously, anything that can catch fire should be away from the stove. Um, and anything such as aluminum or metal objects or anything like that cannot go in the microwave. There is a list of food items that cannot go in the microwave if you looked it up. Uh, so we want to keep all of that in mind. We don't want to do any of that. I know people get curious and they say, you know, what's the, what's the worst that's going to happen if I throw this in the microwave? You don't want to know, right? Because that picture right there depicts what is one of the worst things that's going to happen uh, if you try to test it out. So uh, don't do it. Uh, this is a, a important law that we should know as a result of the fatal fire that happened back in 2017 in the Bronx, uh, where 13 people lost their lives. And what was that fire? That fire was a result of a child, a three-year-old child playing with the stove. Um, and what happened was the fire started on the first floor. It was a non-fireproof building. The occupants left and the door was uh, left open, which allowed the heat and the smoke of the fire to contaminate the rest of the building as the other residents were trying to escape. So what did they come out with? So we came out with Local Law 117, which states that the owner of a multiple dwelling must provide stove knob covers for gas powered stoves in a unit where a child under six years of age resides or provide stove knob covers in a unit without a child under six if the tenant requests them. So regardless whether you have a child under six or not, if you request the stove knob covers, the owners have to provide them for you. It is definitely something that we recommend you have. Uh, it does prevent the child from easily turning the stove on and off. And even if you don't have children in your home, but maybe you have grandchildren or somebody that may be visiting once in a while, again, not a bad idea to have those on hand. Some of the things that we want to keep on hand when we are cooking, we always want to have an oven mitt on hand. We always want to have baking soda and a lid to the pan that we're cooking. Okay, what's going to happen if we have a small grease fire? You want to have that oven mitt on. You want to try and turn off the heat to the stove if you can. Take that baking soda and pour the baking soda over the entire pan. You want to smother that fire, right? This isn't the time to take out the measuring cup and start measuring the baking soda, right? We want to take as much as we can and pour it over the entire pan, smother the fire, take the lid, and put the lid on top. By doing this, you are completely taking all of the oxygen away. Oxygen is one of the three things that this fire needs to burn, all right? So we want to take that away as much as we can. By turning off the heat to the stove, we're taking the heat away. Another thing that this fire needs. So if we can slide that pan off of that hot burner and onto a cool burner that's not hot, even better. What we don't want to do is we don't want to pick up this pot or pan and start running over to the sink. Uh, you're going to be splashing oil and grease all over the place. Now you're in the sink and you're going to use the one thing that you don't use for an, a grease fire, which is water. If uh, you were to look up on YouTube or anything like that, what happens when you put water on a grease fire, uh, it would almost, you would almost think that they poured gasoline on the fire. Uh, and that's exactly what it looks like. You'll see those flames shoot to the ceiling. So we never want to use water on a grease fire. Obviously, in the oven itself, if you do have uh, some kind of fire in the oven, you want to shut off the oven itself, but leave the door closed, right? The oven is made to contain that kind of heat. So keep the door closed. Again, you're going to suffocate the fire, take the oxygen away, and it will go out. Another option that we do have is fire extinguishers, but along with fire extinguishers goes a lot of um training and a bit of knowledge uh, a little bit of practice so a lot of questions come up when we talk about fire extinguishers what kind of fire extinguisher do i need how do i use it how often do i have to change it um you know things like that so to answer that you want to look for an abc extinguisher you'll see the letters on the extinguisher or you'll see some pictures uh which you'll see right there in, in our slide is the symbols those symbols represent the letters A, B, C. So it's the type of fire that that extinguisher will put out. So your type A fire is your ordinary combustibles, which is like your garbage, your plastics, your paper, your wood, rubber, stuff like that. A type B fire is your flammable liquids, your oils, your gasolines, gas, stuff like that. And your type C fires is a fire involving electrical equipment. So if you don't see the letters A, B, C, 
look for the three pictures and make sure there is no X through a picture. If there is an X through a picture, it is telling you that it does not extinguish that type of fire. Therefore, it is not an ABC extinguisher. How do we use the extinguisher? You want to remember the acronym PASS, P-A-S-S. P stands for pulling the pin. There's a pin that goes through the trigger. If you don't pull the pin, you will never be able to squeeze the trigger. So the first thing you have to do is pull the pin. A, you want to aim at the base of the fire. The base of the fire would be inside the pan where the fire is coming from. What you don't want to do is start chasing the flames up towards the cabinets. So A, aim at the base of the fire. You should be standing at least six to 10 feet away and keep yourself in between the fire and your exit. So that if you're not able to put out the fire, you always have a safe escape, a safe escape. you could turn around and get out safely. S, the first S is squeeze. So we're gonna squeeze the trigger, which will uh, help us to discharge the agent inside the extinguisher. And the second S is sweep, sweep side to side. You don't wanna stand there and just aim at the flames. You wanna sweep side to side so that you're covering the entire pan uh, with the extinguishing agent. So pass, P-A-S-S. -S. Make sure that you're checking the gauge on the extinguisher to make sure that the gauge is in the green. If the gauge falls out of the green, it's telling you that the extinguisher does not have enough pressure to extinguish the fire. When you go to squeeze the trigger, it's not going to expel the agent. So you want to make sure that your gauge is in the green. Typically, extinguishers are replaced every 10 to 12 years. You'll see a date stamped on the bottom of it. About 10 years from that date, you want to uh, replace that extinguisher. Uh, you want to keep it in a place that's accessible should you have a fire. So in the middle of the kitchen, near the stove is probably not the best place because that's probably where you're gonna have your fire. So you wanna keep it a distance away from the stove where you'll be able to access it. Maybe just outside of the kitchen uh, would probably be a good spot. Electrical fires, we're seeing a huge influx of electrical fires. So what's happening? What we understand is a lot of people, we have these older buildings, we're all living in these older buildings. Back in the day when the buildings were built, they weren't built with a lot of outlets because we didn't have a lot of things that required so much electricity. Now, everything that we use requires electricity, but the problem is these buildings still have the same amount of outlets that they did back then. Um, but everything we use now needs to be charged, needs to be plugged in. So that is one of the problems we are seeing. So we will go over some of the things that we should or should not be doing, okay? Light bulbs, okay, we're not seeing too many problems with it, but you wanna make sure that you're using uh, a light bulb with the appropriate wattage for the fixture, all right? A lot of people think that they can just put any kind of bulb in a, into a fixture, and that's not the case. The fixtures are rated for a certain amount of wattage, so you want to keep an eye on that. Uh, we want to make sure that we're protecting all our cords from being damaged. If we have a cord that looks like that with the wires exposed, we have to replace that cord as soon as possible. Any kind of item that you're buying, whether it be electrical, a fire extinguisher, uh, even smoke alarms, you want to make sure that you're looking for that UL marking. Underwriters Laboratory is one of the companies that will test and inspect all of these items before they go out for sale. And what they do is they'll put their mark on it saying that it was tested and inspected and it's safe to use. So look for that label. One of the places you're not going to find that label a lot is if you go to like the dollar store, things like that, right? You have to wonder why you're, be, you're able to buy uh, an extension cord for a dollar when you go to Home Depot and you're paying six, seven, eight dollars. There's a reason for it. Okay, and chances are it's not going to be approved by uh, UL. So you want to make sure that you look for that label. Uh, another thing we are seeing a lot is the three-pronged outlets, three-pronged plugs. A lot of people don't have a three-pronged outlet. So they're taking their items that require a three-pronged outlet and they're snapping off the bottom piece, which is actually the ground, and then they're plugging it in. Uh, you don't want to do that. What you want to do is you want to go out and you buy uh, an adapter that will allow you to adapt a two-prong to a three-prong and then you could use that plug. You wanna make sure that you're giving all of these items such as televisions, computers, laptops, plenty of room to breathe, right? And now I know a lot of people are using laptops and relying on the laptops. Notice if you put a laptop on your lap, right? Ironically enough, the laptop is going to heat up. Your leg is gonna get hot. You're gonna feel this thing heating up. Why is that? Because inside the laptop is a fan. That fan is allowing the uh, laptop to cool but the only thing that's allowing it to cool is the air that's circulating underneath the laptop. That's why it has little feet on it because it, it lifts the laptop off the ground ever so slightly to allow air to flow. When you put it on your lap or if you put it on a bed, you are suffocating it, not allowing it to cool itself. And that's where you're gonna get that overheating. So you need these things to breathe. So give them that space to breathe. Uh, if you have an outlet that looks like this, 
Uh, obviously not a good practice at all. Uh, you don't want to overload the outlets. You don't want to start piggybacking extension cords onto extension cords or power strips onto other power strips. Uh, it's a dangerous situation, and we are going to get into that a little bit more in a minute. Um, but what we want to make sure is that we are not plugging any uh, items that heat or cool uh, directly. We have to plug, excuse me, any items that heat or cool directly into the wall outlet. We should not be using extension cords or power strips for these items. So what are we talking about? We're talking about our refrigerator, microwave, space heaters, toaster ovens, air conditioners. If they heat something or they cool something, they have to be plugged directly into the wall. No power strips, no extension cords. Extension cords are for temporary use. They're not made to handle that kind of wattage for that amount of time. Um, so you definitely want to make sure that you're plugging it directly into the wall. So here we are with our power strip surge suppressors, right? We need to understand, and it's a common misconception with these things. There's probably not one person on this uh, meeting right now that does not have one of these in their home, including myself. Uh, and that's not a problem provided you know what's going on and know how to use it and you're using it properly. They do not give you more power. What they're giving you is more access to your outlet. So the two plugs on the wall that you have, you're still getting the same power that you would if you only use the two plugs. The only thing you're doing is giving yourself more access to that outlet, but you are not getting more power. So I've seen uh, surge suppressors and power strips with six plugs, 10 plugs, 12 plugs. That's fine, but you're still not getting more power. So what are we using these for? You're using these things for small wattage, low wattage items, charge your phone, your TV, an alarm clock, a radio, a lamp, things like that. Uh, that's what you want to be using these for. Uh, keep in mind that not all power strips are surge suppressors. So you want to look for that when you purchase it. And again, you want to look for the UL label when you are purchasing these items. If you are relying heavily on these power strips and you're plugging power strip into power strip, uh, then there is a problem and you need to obviously get more outlets installed in your home. Home heating fires, uh, again, and this is what we're seeing, especially during the colder winter months and what is happening. So space heaters, right? That's one of the number one things that we're seeing right now. Uh, and again, something that we did see in this recent uh, fatal fire uh, in the Bronx. What is wrong? So. If you have an older space heater, you're talking 15 years old, you're not even sure how old it is, it's chances are it's time to replace the space heater. Um, you know, they do start to wear out over time uh, and degrade, so you definitely want to replace it uh, if it's that old. What are some of the things we need to keep in mind when using a space heater? You should be turning off and unplugging the space heater once you go to sleep. What you want to do is you want to turn it on and run it and warm up the room that you're going to sleep in while you're still awake. Once you go to sleep, you should be turning it off and unplugging it. It should not be running all night long while you're sleeping. Okay, three feet around the space heater should be free of anything combustible. A space heater needs space, uh, so you can't have anything that can burn three within three feet of the space heater. Also, if you're going to purchase one, you want to make sure that you purchase one that has an automatic shut off feature to it. Should the space heater tip, tip over by mistake, it will shut itself off and you will have to manually go and pick it up and turn it back on again in order for it to turn on. Definitely something you want to look for. Obviously, it is an item that heats something, so it has to be plugged directly into the wall, which is what we mentioned earlier. No extension cords, no power strips. It has to be plugged directly into the wall. What we see a lot of times is people want that heat blowing directly on top of them. So they're plugging it into an extension cord, and then they're keeping it blowing right on top of them on their bed or on their couch. Um, and the problem is, again, that you're using extension cord, number one. Number two, it is too close to you. So should you fall asleep, uh, maybe in the middle of the night, you kick your blanket, it falls off the bed, and it falls and lands on top of the space heater, this is a problem. So again, uh, it should not be running all night long, and you should not be using an extension cord with the space heater. Uh, if you feel a, a cord becoming hot over time, Right, not a problem if it's warm, but if it becomes hot, there is a problem. Stop using the heater, uh, turn it off, unplug it, and have it checked out or replaced. Okay, just a, a quick warning on the bottom 
The use of portable kerosene and propane space heaters is prohibited and illegal in New York City. Uh, so we want to stick with those uh, electric space heaters um, if we can. Lithium ion batteries. This is another thing that has come to our attention uh, recently, and we are seeing more and more fires with them. Uh, so these are still being looked into, but just a few things that we want to keep in mind, right? These batteries are, are, are in a lot of items that we use today, cell phones, laptops, tablets, electric cars, and scooters. And that's where we're seeing some of the problems, the electric bikes, the electric scooters. Um, they store a lot of energy and there's a lot of batteries required for these scooters and electric bikes. So we want to make sure that you are using them properly because they can overheat, they can catch fire, and they can explode. Uh, and what we have seen recently is that they will explode violently. There is little warning that they are going to uh, combust or explode, and once they do, it is pretty violent. So again, something you want to keep in mind, you should be using the charger that comes with the appliance that you're using it for, uh, and you should be charging it outdoors if possible. Okay, so here we go. So again, it is an item that is approved by UL. So we wanna make sure that we're looking for the UL markings uh, when we purchase any of these items that have a lithium ion battery. Again, follow the manufacturer, manufacturer's instructions for charging and storage, but we do recommend that they are charged outdoors whenever possible, and they are not charged overnight. Um, you don't wanna charge uh, any kind of smaller device under your pillow or on your bed or on a couch or anything like that, right? Our phones. I'm sure we're all very used to just plugging our phones in at night and going to bed, waking up in the morning, taking it off, right? If you do notice every once in a while, your phone does get hot itself, right? So you shouldn't be leaving it on your pillow or your bed or any kind of newspapers or anything like that. Um, use the cord and power adapter that's made for the device, right? We don't want to start buying these aftermarket cords and devices. Um, that's not, uh, they're not reliable. We want to stick with the manufacturer's cord and adapters whenever possible. We want to keep the batteries at room temperature. We don't want them sitting in direct sunlight. Uh, and of course, we want to store these batteries away from anything that can burn. All right. That's just going to make the situation worse. If you do notice anything going wrong, and this is with the lithium ion batteries or any kind of appliance that you may be using. If you notice um, some kind of odor or a change in color or shape or leaking, some kind of odd noise, immediately discontinue use. Uh, move device away from anything that can catch fire and call 911. Don't hesitate to call. Give us a call. We'll come and check it out. A lot of people are asking questions about how do we dispose of these batteries? Well, um, putting them in your trash or recycling is illegal. Okay, so you can recycle them by taking them to the battery recycling location, or you can visit this website right here, nyc.gov slash batteries, uh, and they will give you disposal instructions, uh, which is probably the best way to go. Uh, individually bagged batteries or tape ends before disposing, right? We don't want battery, the ends of batteries, the contacts to be touching other battery contacts or touching any kind of metal because that will create uh, sparks and heat and a fire. Like I mentioned earlier, smoking, number one cause of fires nationwide. And look at this number. Smokers are seven times more likely than non-smokers to have a fire. That is a huge number. Uh, so what can we do? Well, we can stop smoking, right? That's easier said than done, I understand. Um, however, if we are going to smoke, uh, we wanna try and smoke outdoors. If we have to smoke indoors, we wanna make sure that we're using large, deep ashtrays. Completely douse the cigarette butt with water before discarding. And what we mean by that is, what we suggest is you have a can or a jar filled with water and you put the cigarette butt in that jar or can. What we're seeing a lot is people will take the cigarette butt and they'll throw it under the sink, under the water for like a split second and then throw it in the garbage. Well, chances are they may not have completely extinguished the cigarette and it goes in the garbage can and it's not gonna light right away. It's going to take a few hours um, while it's sitting in there in that garbage can where that fire is gonna really start to burn. So you wanna make sure that you are completely dousing that cigarette before you discard of it. Never smoke while laying down or while you're on any kind of heavy medication or drugs or alcohol where you're going to fall asleep with a cigarette in your hand. Candle fires. We're not seeing as many candle fires as we used to, um, but we are still seeing candle fires. Um, and thanks to flameless candles, I think that has saved quite a bit 
uh, in regards to the candle fires. But if you do re, um, uh, want to use an open flame candle, we recommend that you place candles at least four feet away from anything that can burn, such as candle uh, curtains, draperies, decorations, blinds, things like that. You want to keep these candles out of reach of children and pets, and you want to extinguish the candle before leaving the room. I'm not saying leaving your house. I'm saying leaving the room. So if you have a candle burning in the living room and you're going to go into the bedroom, you should be blowing out that candle. Okay, not when you leave the house, but when you leave the room. Candles are not made for emergency lighting. Should you lose power, you should not go around the house lighting candles. Uh, you should have batteries and flashlights on hand should you uh, lose power. Also, if you went to the flameless candles like we are suggesting, which are battery operated, you could use those candles should you lose power. So again, the flameless candle is definitely the way to go. If you forget to turn it off, no big deal, right? You can just replace the battery uh, and you could always use them for light if you lose power. So the flameless candles are the way to go uh, and something that we do highly recommend. Early detection, smoke alarms. And I, I, I know Madam President had mentioned the smoke alarms uh, earlier. And again, here are those numbers that I was talking about. They reduce your chances of dying in a fire by 50%. 70% of fire deaths occur in homes with a non-functioning smoke alarm or no alarm present. That is a big number. So what's recommended? We recommend that uh, you have at least one smoke and combo, uh, smoke and CO combo alarm on every floor and a smoke only alarm in every bedroom. Um, these are just a little bit of specifics as far as where the alarm should be installed. Uh, I'm not gonna go too crazy with the alarms. I know um, Jay from the Red Cross is gonna go into the alarms a bit more and the program that is available to everyone uh, to have the alarms installed. But as far as maintenance goes, you want to make sure that you're testing your alarm once a month by pressing the test button. Uh, should you still have an older alarm that uses removable batteries, when are we changing those batteries? We're changing them twice a year when we change our clock. Change your clock, change your battery. That's coming up next month, uh, I believe on the 13th, I believe, uh, of March. So we want to make sure that we are changing the batteries. However, we do recommend if you can to upgrade to the new smoke alarms, which have a sealed 10 year battery inside of them. The battery is non-replaceable. It is non-removable, okay? What's gonna happen is after about 10 years, the battery inside will start to die and you will hear the chirping to tell you that the battery is dying just like the ones that you have now. At that point, it's just time to replace the alarm instead of replacing the entire battery, but you don't have to worry about changing the batteries twice a year. So what are some of the noises that you're going to hear from your alarm? A single chirp, like I had mentioned, every 30 to 60 seconds. That's telling you that you have a low battery or a malfunctioning uh, alarm in the, in the smoke alarm itself. When do you hear these, right? Your alarm usually malfunctions or the battery dies at like 2 o'clock in the morning, right? It never happens at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. The batteries always die at 2 in the morning when you're half asleep and you wake up and you hear the chirp and now you're freaking out. Well, don't freak out. Uh, just understand and know that the... Chirp is telling you that the alarm uh, is either malfunctioning or has a low battery, okay? And it needs to be replaced as soon as possible. If you have a combo alarm, smoke and carbon monoxide, three long beeps is for smoke or fire, and four quick chirps is for carbon monoxide. Uh, I am setting off an alarm in here right now, but I've been told in the past that our microphone blocks that out. So I'm not sure if anybody's really hearing it right now. Um, so, good. Uh, so yeah, so the four short beeps is for carbon monoxide. Now, what's gonna happen? You're gonna look around and you're gonna hear four short beeps and you're gonna say, there's nothing going on. What's wrong with this thing? This firefighter, he told me these, these things are great. I don't see anything wrong. Well, that's because it's going off for carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is also known as a silent killer. It's a, it's a gas that you can't see, smell, taste. It's undetectable to human senses, by human senses. So you're not gonna know that there is carbon monoxide other than the fact that your alarm is going off. So pay attention to the alarm, uh, open up the windows, get some fresh air, get outside and call 911. Again, the alarm is gonna go off at a low level of carbon monoxide, but we're not, you're not sure how fast that carbon monoxide is building. So you wanna make sure that you are um, opening the windows and getting outside and calling 911. We have meters that will enable us to detect where it's coming from, and then we'll be able to shut the source. Uh, just a quick thing on carbon monoxide, 
basically it's a product of incomplete combustion. So, you know, where you have, um, you know, fuel burning appliances and things like that, if it's not fully burning the fuel, that's where you're getting that off gas of carbon monoxide. So you want to make sure that you're careful of that uh, during the snow and, and this season. I know a lot of people have remote starts, including myself. If you park your car and there's snow blocking your tailpipe, right? What happens? You start your car remotely and now the car is running. Well, if the snow is blocking the tailpipe, it's blocking the exhaust. All of that exhaust is now kicking back into your car. And in that exhaust is carbon monoxide. So that is something you want to be aware of, especially during these winter months. Okay, so still do you still see the screen or uh no not not at the moment. Um no. look at, there we go. It's coming back. Okay. Now yeah. Okay, so uh so something that we do take for granted is uh fire safety for the deaf and hard of hearing. Uh, again, something that we want to keep in mind. You. Can hear you. Oh, no, I, 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 I can hear you guys okay. Um... Yeah, we're good. Okay. Uh, so something we do take for we can't hear you. Um, the person who's saying that you can't hear, um, if you can maybe drop a note in the chat to me. But uh, but uh, we we do hear FDNY okay on our end. I can hear you. Okay. So again, something that I we hate to... you. We just take for granted. Reminder, everybody can keep their mics muted, so we can just let FDNY continue the presentation. That would be ideal. Thank you. Uh, is uh, so again uh, for the deaf and hard of hearing. There are uh, smoke alarms out there. Uh, to assist uh, anyone that is deaf or hard of hearing, right? They're not going to hear your average smoke alarm. So what do we have? We have something called a life tone alarm, which is depicted here. Uh, and just a brief thing on how this thing operates. It's basically a bedside alarm. It's, a, it's an alarm clock, which you're going to put next to your bed, and you're going to have that little pad with the little wire coming out that's vibrating. That's going to go under your pillow. And we synchronize a smoke alarm to this bedside alarm. So anytime your smoke alarm goes off in your house, it will activate this bedside alarm. That bedside alarm will vibrate the pad while you're sleeping. You will wake up and you'll look and you'll see, it'll say fire on the screen. It will be going off saying fire out of the uh, alarm itself. And uh, that will alert somebody that is maybe deaf or hard of hearing that's not gonna hear your average alarm to wake up and that their smoke alarm is activating. So definitely something that we wanna take advantage of. Last thing we want to go over briefly is planning your escape, right? So we talked about this earlier is one of the things that um, leads to the likelihood of being a fatal fire victim is not having uh, a proper escape plan. So something that you definitely want to have with everybody in your home and that you want to go over. Okay. And this is just a little brief draw a floor plan of what it may look like that something that you want to go over. Just point to the exits, uh, ways that you can get out of your home, where the smoke alarms are, where the fire escapes are, windows, doors. Things like that, uh, definitely something that we want to have. If you look on the bottom of this picture, it says meeting place, at least 30 feet away. You want to make sure that you have a meeting place somewhere that you're going to meet once you get out of your home. Uh, you know, some people tend to go one way. Maybe somebody goes out the fire escape, somebody goes out the front door. You need to all meet at the same place so that you know that everybody is out safely. Okay. One of the things that is going to determine how and what you're going to do in your fire in a fire is knowing the type of building you live in fireproof versus non fireproof. Okay. And if you are not sure what type of building you live in, it will be posted in the lobby or you can check on the, the department of buildings website and that will tell you exactly what type of building you live in. So what is the difference? Well, the difference is here. If you live in a fire, a non fireproof building, okay, non fireproof, which is typically and there are always exceptions to these rules, but typically uh, seven stories or less or less than 75 feet in height is typically a non fireproof building. 
uh, but you will see exceptions. Uh, they're going to have fire escapes and things like that. If you live in a non fireproof building and the fire is in your building, you need to leave immediately. Whether the fire is in your apartment or is in another apartment, you need to get out of the building. Now, if the fire is in your apartment, close the door behind you. The more doors you close and isolate that fire, the better off it's going to be for everybody escaping the building and for first responders coming into the building. We're not going to be encountering any of that heat or smoke until we get to the door of the apartment and the residents will be able to escape without uh, having to worry about any of that smoke or heat coming out of the apartment because the door is closed. So make sure you're closing the door behind you when you leave. Now, if you live in a fireproof building and the fire is in your apartment, again, same thing. You're going to leave immediately and make sure you close the door behind you. But this is where everything changes. And this is what we saw in the fire uh, a month ago, a uh, fireproof building. If you live in a fireproof building and the fire is not in your apartment, it is usually safer to stay inside your apartment rather than entering the dangerous smoke filled hallways. Okay. The building is made to contain the fire within the area that it started. The building is made of concrete, cement, and things like that that are going to prevent the fire from spreading to other apartments. By leaving the door open, you're allowing that fire and that smoke to contaminate the rest of the building. And the more doors that are opened, the more that smoke is going to spread and contaminate the rest of the building. So, and, and the hesitancy is people will look at you sometimes and they'll look at me and they'll say, wait a second. So if there's a fire in my building, you want me to stay in the building? Well, yes, if it's a fireproof building, yes. Uh, what you may see is maybe you'll see some smoke coming in from underneath your door. Take a damp towel and throw it underneath the door if there's a little gap in the door to prevent the smoke from coming in. Throw a little duct tape around the outside the edges of the door, around the door frame. Prevent that smoke from coming in. You can open up your windows to get fresh air, provided there's no smoke coming in from that fire apartment. Uh, you know, you want to make sure that you're blocking off any vents that may be allowing any smoke to come in. Other than that, stay inside your apartment. Don't hesitate to call 911 if you feel you're in danger or you're, you're nervous, you're not sure if you're doing the right thing. Call 911 and the dispatch will uh, direct you on what to do. They will also notify the units on scene to check up on you inside your apartment. We will come to the apartment, we'll check on you, we'll make sure everything is okay, and if we feel the need to evacuate you, we will do it all ourselves along with you, uh, where instead of you trying to evacuate yourself. Last, uh, last things in case of fire, again, we don't wanna try and fight the fire ourselves other than that small window of opportunity that we discussed earlier for kitchen fires. 30 to 45 seconds is about the window that you have to put out that fire before the fire is beyond your control. Keep in mind that a fire doubles in size every 30 to 60 seconds. That is not a lot of time. So again, something that you need to keep in mind. Uh, private home, I, am, I, I, I did see a, a quick thing in the chat. Private homes are non-fireproof buildings. So you wanna treat that as a non-fireproof. You live in a private home, uh, fire is anywhere in the home, you need to get out immediately, okay? Uh, we are not stopping to gather anything. We want to use the closest, safest exit. And what are we not using? We are not using the elevators. We want to use the staircases to exit the building. And again, close the door on our way out. Okay. Uh, make sure that you um, call 911. And again, we do get the question every so often. What if I'm absolutely trapped and I have nowhere to go? The fire's in my apartment and I'm stuck. Okay. Well, my typical answer to that is if you have the working smoke and carbon monoxide alarms, like we suggest, you shouldn't be in that position. However, if you do find yourself in that position, uh, you want to make sure that you close all the doors between you and the fire and you call 911 as soon as possible. Open up a window, get people's attention, let us know that you're in there. Last, uh, last thing is strategies for families with members with autism. Again, something that I think that a lot of us take for granted. All right. Um, People with autism respond well to routine. So practice, practice, practice. Go over the fire drills with them. Uh, you don't want the first time that they're trying to get out of a fire is in a fire, right? Practice the fire drill. Uh, wrap them in a blanket or a coat to give them that sense of security. And pick a meeting place outside that's quiet and familiar. You don't want to take somebody that has autism and put them in the middle of 
uh, a busy street or an intersection where there's cars and honking and everything else where it's chaotic. Keep them somewhere that's quiet and familiar to them. So a lot of information that uh, Captain Kozo just spoke about, and I saw in the chat, you know, in terms of somebody uh, having requested a presentation for the building. Key thing that we're taking away with all this information and something that Bishop Rosario said right at the beginning or right before the presentation that, that really resonates. The purpose of this presentation and the purpose of ultimately forums like these is how we can work as a community together, right? How can we bring all these topics, which is comprehensive ultimately when you talk about all levels of fire prevention and fire education and how to insert that in our everyday lives? Well, the real thing is about repetition and enforcing education and strengthening education. And how we can do that ultimately is by working with the FDNY or working with the Red Cross, ultimately in bringing these initiatives uh, to uh, houses of worship, uh, to, to, to faith-based organization, to uh, tenant organizations, community-based organizations. It's at no cost, and we have a robust program uh, through our community affairs office. Mike, uh, Captain Kozo, overseeing fire safety education. We also have um, our community engagement team, which basically connects. And in, in, in addition, we do partner with the Red Cross, which again, we will speak, or uh, Jason Lyons, who's gonna be speaking on behalf of the Red Cross, will talk about a little bit about the initiatives. But just to answer the question of what we can, how we can partner and how we could take it from there with this information. Well, fire safety education training, similar to what you heard today from Captain Kozo, are, are some of the major, is one of the major tools to utilize. Um, after today's training, I'm going to send a one pager on the different topics clearly identified here that you heard today and that you see on the screen right now. But essentially, we can tailor presentations depending on the community, depending on the language. We have multiple uh, pamphlets that are also available electronically, which I'll put in the chat a little later um, of where to access it, but that we can provide for you to help us spread that message and continuously do it. Um, but one thing that I would say we encourage everybody and we please request, do invite us to your to the forum to speak uh, to, to, to your congregants, to residents, to your constituents, ultimately um, uh, uh, to bring this fire safety training uh, back to your community. Again, we highlight all aspects as you see on the screen, everything that uh, uh, the Captain Kozo spoke about, basically to enforce that message. And we can even break it up seasonally. The one thing I would say with fire safety education trainings too, being that we can break it down seasonally, as, as the captain had mentioned, right before November, where we do see a spike in fire due to the winter and it being the home heating season, we do maybe want to work early in the, in, 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 the, uh, in the fall or even throughout the summertime to basically see about key dates on how we can work uh, with organizations or with houses of worship uh, to basically emphasize this message. You know. When we talk about fire safety education, it's not only just these presentations, but we also make it interactive. Uh, we do have city firehouses and EMS stations and a fire zone in Manhattan. Again, each firehouse um, is provided the tools through our education unit to basically provide presentations like these. First responders um, do see it firsthand, do encounter it firsthand, and we are constantly as a unit uh, providing the education. It's a vital resource. It's a vital tool. And if you want to schedule it, we will give you that information to share uh, with the, with your communities. Hands on practice inside uh, the department's mobile safety experience. Some of you may have already seen it, but we're out in the community. It's a huge safety trailer, primarily for youth, but for larger events where we do 100 or plus kids more to bring that out, uh, typically with schools. Um, but again, it's a firsthand interactive experience that can be requested. How to do so? Again, I will share it in the in the chat of what's the website um, and what's the emails of how to formally request. And again, just more interactive and how we tailor it to younger crowds or different crowds. We also have our mascots just to make it more fun and family filled to basically make the education uh, more appealing and more interactive at the same time. Um, again, I'm not going to go too de too deep into this because uh, Jason Lyons is going to speak about uh, the partnership that we have the Red Cross. But again, one thing to take away here. Is promotion on the program that Red Cross will speak on. Great program that we're doing uh, between us, sponsored through the FDNY Foundation and the Red Cross, in which uh, retired firefighters and Red Cross volunteers installed. But again, Jason uh, from the Red Cross will speak on that a little bit more. Again, just a takeaway, and what we will do after this training is, again, within the week, we are going to be sending, based off the RSVP list, 
uh, that the Bronx, Bronx Borough President's Office um, has has uh, will provide us from this evening is that we will provide ways on how to basically establish these partnerships. We encourage everyone to coordinate fire safety trainings. Presentations again are approximately 45 to 50 minutes more for adults um, and for larger groups. It can either be in person or virtual, but we also do classrooms, schools, um, again, faith based organizations, houses of worship. Uh, we can tailor it specifically to the need and the message in itself. Again, we also we, we can break it down based on language. Needs. We have content uh, that's available in multiple languages that we can help disseminate. We have PSAs, digital content that we will be sharing as part of this, uh, this safety education toolkit that we'll be sending post presentation. Coordinate smoke alarm installation registration events. Again, more something that Jason from the Red Cross will talk about, but we encourage you as part of this evening to walk away once we provide the information post this event is basically to bring us and maybe even work with housing organizations or buildings uh, that you live in um, to basically bring this registration and also free installation program to your, to your community. And again, one thing that I will say with community-based organizations, houses of worship, or faith-based organizations, post this evening, we are going to be providing a toolkit which basically provides awareness on seasonal fire safety messaging via online, either through social media, PSAs, stuff that you can share and disseminate electronically. One thing I will say is throughout, you know, between uh, the changer clock, changer battery, which happens coincidentally with uh, daylight savings time, we are gonna be sending messaging. But one thing to take into account, right before the home heating season, um, as I mentioned, is National Fire Prevention Week, which this year is occurring October 9th through the 15th. I will encourage everyone to basically at that point given messaging that we were going to be providing after this evening is to help us share. We're going to be calling and reminding everybody to partner with us well in advance of that October timeframe, but that is going to be one period that we will heavily rely on community partnerships to get this message across. Again, the FDNY has a robust community affairs team. How to get in contact? Community affairs at fdny.nyc.gov. I will put it on the chat uh, before the presentation's over. And again, if you want a fire safety presentation, remember that website right there. WW, I see one misspelling, but apologies on it. www.fdnysmart.org. Again, we will put that on the chat. Um, again, for any literature, request for fire safety education, um, or any information, fdnysmart.org, or you can email us directly, communityaffairs at fdny.nyc.gov. Jason, are you there? Mr. you guys good? You guys done? Yeah. All right, cool. So, I'll... all right, guys. So, thanks for um, this opportunity. I trust everyone can hear me clearly. Can yeah. Clearly? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, the volume's a little bit low. Louder. We can hear you. Try to speak up a little bit more. All right, I'm going to share a, a PowerPoint here, guys, briefly. Just uh, let's go in. Trust everyone can see my screen now. Yep. All right, guys. My name is Jason. I'm from the Red Cross. I'm going to be taking you a quick presentation, not too long to, in respect of your time, just to tell you a little bit about some initiatives we have at the Red Cross that you can be uh, partake in, right? So, as uh, the, the amazing team from FDNY mentioned, you know, we, we work together uh, as organizations in with one objective here that's saving a life. Right. And as the Red Cross, you guys know we, we have different uh, crews that do different things. So when there's a fire, you would see our response teams on the ground um, alongside the FDNY doing a response work, you know, shouting folks, making sure people have places to stay in, in immediate sense, and then looking at, um, you know, how can we give them care long term? So that's what our recovery teams have to then we have the mitigation and preparedness team, which is uh, what I'm responsible for across Greater New York. And what we do is that we make sure, we try to do our best to make sure that all sections of society have the education that is needed for disaster preparedness, right? Fires, home fires are one of the biggest ones that we And I hear you, Jason. Change the mic. Volume is really low, Mr. Jason. Your volume is really low. One second, guys. 
It's okay. Uh, <clears throat> Jason, if, so yeah, if you click the arrow next to the microphone icon there, um, we can just try audio settings again. Um, when you go there, there's a slider for the microphone. Is it turned all the way to the right, all the way up? Well, what was that? I think it, it just got actually a little bit quieter. It's, it's all the way up. It's all the way up. Okay. Let me use a system and see. System. Yeah, yeah. Under, under the microphone, are there any other options besides? Uh, how, how, how is this now? Is this any uh, better? That is much better. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Let me share that video again. That uh, cool. slide. Perfect. Thanks for calling that out. Yeah, as I was saying that, you know, we, for at the Red Cross, we partner with FDNY on many different initiatives, right? And and uh, the image on the screen kind of talks about the cycle of a disaster. And when there's a impact, for instance, when there's a home fire, we we are alongside FDNY on the ground, making sure that everyone has uh, that was affected uh, has a place to sleep for a few nights, and uh, and and, ext and then we do recovery that has them placed in housing for a longer period. We give them some initial care and things like that. My responsibility here is with the Red Cross in Greater New York is ensuring that we have we do some mitigation and some preparedness of the entire Greater New York community, right? Uh, in, in preparedness, we target all sections of society and all demographics in society. And so we have a number of programs that I'm going to be talking about tonight, very, very briefly, that we deliver to all different audiences and so tonight is your opportunity to learn about these opportunities and how you can be a part of it uh, in two ways one by being a participant and two more importantly by being that voice that spreads the word about these programs or creating opportunities for your community to get this education in your community right so we're going to talk through these different programs and we're going to talk about it uh, again if you have any questions please go ahead and post it in the chat we have some folks monitoring the chat from red cross as well as fdny is there so they can look at the chat and give you some answers promptly all right so as i mentioned we have different three different areas in the red cross in preparedness uh, that we're going to be speaking to tonight uh, the first one is youth preparedness so one of the things that we've found over the years is that giving the message of preparedness uh home fire preparedness general preparedness to youth is very effective in that they take it and they grow up with it, it becomes part of their culture but but not just that they also take it and bring it home to the family members right now most those of you that have children know that you know if your kid comes up and say hey daddy mommy auntie uncle well, whatever we need to do this you're going to try to pay attention and so um, you know, this is what I was taught in school, and this is how we need to do it. So we have this program called the Pillowcase Program. We've been uh, doing this program for years, uh, and it is education to children about preparedness, and, and namely home fire preparedness, uh, grades three to five. Uh, so far, uh, we've been since uh, January night. We have done this in. Uh, we have done fif uh, fifteen uh, of these sessions in the Bronx area. I have a list I can show you guys in a second of all the schools that we've touched so far, and we're going to be doing a lot more in, in that in the in the West Bronx area over the next couple of months. But if you are interested, it doesn't have to be a school. It can be a, a church. It can be a camp. It can be a, a the Y. It can be any audience that we can find in youth, we can deliver this program. Another program that we have for children is called the Prepare with Prejudice program. Again, it, it delivers the same type of information, but in a different style, right? Uh, and this is for children in grades from kindergarten to grades two. Yes, believe it, that young, we are molding minds and changing personality and changing attitudes towards uh, what they need to do to reduce the risk of fires and other hazards in their home and in their community. The Home Fire Campaign Program, you heard uh, Captain Koza speak about this, you heard my good friend Fabricio speak about this from the FDNY, uh, you heard some of the, the elected speak about this. It is a, it's an amazing program. The Home Fire Campaign uh, is a program where we come into your home, right? Uh, we, we actually take a step back, you, you request it, so you can go to this website you see on screen. It's a free program, F-R-E-E -E program, where you can go on this website, request the service, right? Once you request the service, it goes into a, a, a list, a database, and then we come out and serve you. Uh, we work closely with the FDNY. They might be the ones serving you, or our volunteers might be the ones serving you. 
right? Uh, they, 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 we come to your home, we educate you on home fire preparedness, what to do to prepare for them, what to do to prevent them, how you should uh, respond to them. And, and, and then we encourage you to share that information. We also help you do some home fire escape planning. We, we give you a card and show you how to do that home fire escape planning. So you're having this intimate session with an expert teaching you how to do all these things in your home, for your home, specifically designed for your home. So think about it. It's amazing. Free program. Sign up on that website you see on screen, soundthealarm.org forward slash NYC. Anyone can sign up for the program. We will come to your home and deliver the program. Uh, any questions again you have, put it in the chat and we're going to get it. Uh, we do install, as recommended by FDY, as you saw earlier, one uh, combination alarm or carbon monoxide and smoke alarm on every level of your home. And then we install, on recommendation, in your bedroom, one smoke alarm in every bedroom. Now, if you choose not to, we can't force it on you, but that's the recommendation that we go by to try to make sure that your home is safe, right? Moving on. Spend the video. Escape. One second, guys. Sharing. I need to share this again. All right. So the, the, the next program we have that I wanted to mention is, you know, one of the other hazards that we face is the, 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 the cardiac arrest hazard. We also teach hands-only CPR, and whilst we doing we using this forum to, to talk about the the sound the, the smoke alarm program, we want to also mention to you that hey, this is also another hazard that's there. We teach this program as well, so we want to make sure that you know you can also capitalize this. everything that I'm showing you is free. Just let us know, and we come out and do that training with you. Now, there's another program that I want to, want to mention called the BYU Crush Ready Program. There's a lot of writing on screen, so I'm not going to go through it. But what it is is that we come to Whatever audience you have, it could be a, a your house of worship, it could be a school, it could be a, 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 a community gathering, and take you through these different types of hazards, how to prevent them, how to prepare for them, how to respond to them, how to recover from them, right? Including the fire hazard, the home fire hazard, and and so uh, again, request this uh, this this training from us, and we come out to your home and deliver it. Now uh, that's where I want to pause in terms of. What, what the programs that we offer, but I just wanted to show you what we've been doing in the West Bronx area so far. So right now we are delivering all these programs that you see on screen in these four community council areas. Uh, we continue to do that. We have the support from NYSEM and FDOMI, as you can imagine, FDOMI is all over it is delivering these programs. We continue to do that, but we want you to help us get the message out there. You know, we, we, we just like, as, as, as my friends from FDMI was saying, you know, we can, we can talk this over and over and over to the same people, but it goes nowhere if the message is not reaching everyone. So we need your assistance uh, to help get the message out there about the programs that are offered uh, to, to, from the Red Cross and FDNY, how they can get outfitted with these programs and how they can get trained and educated to prevent uh, home fires from happening altogether. But if you know, uh, if if they do happen, what folks can do to respond to those those home fires and what they can do to recover from them. So you want to get the, that message out to to the community as best as possible. We need your help in doing that. You can use the website that I gave before, soundthealarm.org, NYC, to sign up for the alarms. If you do want one of these programs, please please just email me. My email is there, jason.lines at redcross.org. Or you can email above ogre.wallace at redcross.org. Um, I'm going to pause here uh, and take any questions if anyone has any, uh, and, and um, I'll be over for the night. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you, you so Jason. much, Jason. So, uh, please put your questions in the chat. Thank you. Yeah, so Jason, I did see uh, there were a few questions about a variety of concerns with uh, smoke alarms for people with a uh, you know, variety of circumstances in yes. the chat there. Um, so I can I can I can attempt to answer a couple of them. Uh, all right, I'll 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 start from the one from Sandy. Is there a smoke alarm that is placed for disabled persons and change batches when needed? Yes, uh, as Captain Kozo said earlier, and or Fabricio, uh, we do install for you free of course, free of course. The the alarm that uh, Captain Kozo showed you earlier, the uh, the life tone alarm that connects that works with 
the smoke alarm that vibrates your bed. We do install those. As a matter of fact, uh, we do have right now, we started a program recently where we install uh, uh, the, the the alarms that flash, so the so the so the strobe alarms that flash. So someone that's that's deaf or hard of hearing can see it, right? So we have the the alarms that sound, we have the alarms that vibrate your bed, we have the ones that you can see. So any of these options, we will install for persons that have uh, functional needs of access challenges, uh, persons sure. with disabilities. So please let us know, and we can um, we can. We can get it going for you, uh, Jason. Jason, yes. real quick, uh, just for a point of clarity, I, with the installations of the alarms, especially of the bed shakers or the strobe ones, right? I think we just want to make clear that it, it's not to the same degree that we install as a running right. smoke or, or or combination alarm. So again, I don't know, Kev, do you want to mention a little bit about more uh, how many typically, like if if there is the need for a bed shaker or a strobe, like how many typically how they installed? We typically uh, install uh, a bed shaker in every bed that somebody would be sleeping in that is hard of hearing, uh, and we would install the strobe uh, alarms in the common areas, uh, you know, wherever they would be, uh, the living room or anything like that. Uh, that's typically where we'll install these alarms. Yeah. yeah. I'm looking at the questions here to see if there are any questions. Uh, uh, there was a question earlier. We are slowly reading. Sorry. Okay. Uh, do you have a date? So there was can I, a... can I, can I interject because my, my question is not being answered. Sure. Go um, ahead. I'm a disabled veteran, uh -huh. so I can't reach high. If there's, if the alarm, regardless, whether it's a flasher or placed under the bed, the specific alarm that's being placed high up on the wall, does that need to be. Is that a like a battery replacement type of unit? Because if it is, then it's still a still a condition for a disabled person. The alarms that we install are ten year, non removable, non replaceable bat, uh, ba batteries. So you do not have to remove the alarm. You do not have to remove the batteries. You do not have to replace the batteries. They we install them and they last for ten years. Does that answer the question? Yes, until after 10 years, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, after 10 years, you call us again and we come and do it again. Come uh, and do the same Jason, thing again. Jason, just one thing to add though, just it's the important still, even though it's a 10 year, you still have to test because again, a 10 year sealed doesn't necessarily mean that the message is that you have to replace it every 10 years. You have to note if it's defective or not by testing that alarm monthly. The right. alarm will notify you if it's defective or not by, by a sound that it makes. If it's a continuous chirping outside of it being tested, but the message that we do want to state and how Jason's mes me mentioning that if you do have to replace the alarm, it's not the batteries anymore. It's the whole unit in itself, which the Red Cross or the FDNY and assistance will, will assist in installing it. But again, you should be testing those alarms monthly by pushing that test button regardless. And if you can't reach it, you could, uh, you could take a broom, a broom handle or anything. It's just basically pushing that button ultimately. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, something that I saw in the chat as well that I wanted to mention, um, and we've encountered this quite a bit, Some, well, not quite a bit, we've encountered this sometimes. Some persons, uh, for various reasons, um, you know, choose to try to, to stay away from getting this service, right? It might, they might think that, oh, well, FDNY or the Red Cross is, government affiliated for persons that may be undocumented persons that don't speak english think that uh, well you know they, they they probably don't have anybody that speaks my language all of that is incorrect right we 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 have a, a slew of different language speakers that can come to you to speak to you and educate you in your language whether it be local uh, or or foreign language then we also you know we we serve this to anyone Anywhere there is a home, anywhere that it, there is a bed, as you just heard Fabricio mentioned. So it's not about, you know, we're not we're not differentiating about anything else. It's just we're serving class. We want to save lives here. So um, that has been an obstacle we've encountered in the past, and persons not requesting it because of that reason. And so we just wanted to clear the air on that. You please request it, and we'll come and get it installed for you. Jason, I did see one question. Um... <clears throat> about 20 minutes ago, 
where somebody asked uh, about wired smoke alarms that they have. Uh, and do they replace the smoke detectors or just the batteries? Uh, you know, what are, what are the recommendations on? I would like to defer that question to Captain Kozor for pretty sure regarding the, the question. The question is, I have a wired smoke alarms. Do I replace the smoke detectors or just the batteries? I mean, yeah, I did answer that. I, I addressed that in the, in the chat. Um, so the wired smoke alarms still have a battery backup inside of them uh, that do need to be replaced if you still have one of those. Um, and again, the alarm itself should be replaced every 10 years. Hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. Uh, this is Elise. I'm the one that placed. I saw that, but my okay. second question was, can I do that myself or do I need to have electrician? You can do it yourself if, if, you know, I mean, that's, you could definitely change the batteries yourself. The hardwired alarm itself, you can change yourself. There's not much to it, but again, I can't speak for you. I'm not really sure how familiar or unfamiliar you are with it. Um, so it may help you to get someone to, to give you a hand doing that. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Are there any other questions from anyone? Hello, yes. How you doing, everyone? Cassine <clears throat> Porter. I just was uh was gonna reference to something that was said earlier. If anyone is unsure of what type of building they live in, they can uh visit their local firehouse and uh, they should be able to assist you with classifying what type of building that you're living in. Most NYCHA buildings are fireproof. Uh, so you if you're in a NYCHA building. It's more than likely it's fireproof, uh, even if the, the, th the three story buildings are also uh, fireproof. But if you, uh, the fire, the fire, uh, FDNY has a thing called a SIDS. And actually, you know, so when we get a call, it pops up and it gives us information on the building. You can find out, you know, like I said, you can visit your local firehouse and they can tell you pretty much uh, what's type of building you living in and then you also can look that up online as they said to where you can get the information on the type of building you're in yeah thank you for that uh that's that's a good point of reference in terms of just the firehouse but to again just re-emphasize re the 311 or the department of will buildings website the new york city department of buildings website is again you could type in your address or, or look um ultimately to see if your type of building now just to clarify though with nycha not every NYCHA is fireproof. Again, it all depends on the building that you live in. There are certain NYCHAs that are non-fireproof. Again, the best way is, is how it's mentioned either uh, to the point, if you want to go to your local firehouse and check, that's one. But we do recommend just because of, you know, it, just accessibility, even though they're widespread throughout the city. But just to make it easier, call 311 or go on the New York City Department of Buildings to determine if the building is fireproof or non-fireproof. But thank you for that point. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Can yes, you hear me? Okay. Yes, mm -hmm. So, quick question: When you say building is uh, fireproof, how many hours are we saying it can uh, prevent fire? Is it one hour, two hours? The buildings, the the fireproof building has a rating, usually a three to four hour rating, uh, for the wall ceilings, uh, all surrounding. Uh, before it's going to really start to deteriorate from the fire. And again, that, that is all dependent on the severity of the fire. Um, but usually it's a three to four hour rating uh, mm -hmm. at the minimum. Um, rest assured, our response time is about four minutes. So you should be, you should be in, uh, in good hands at that point. Okay, uh, good evening. I have my hand, I raised my hand up. Uh, I don't know if I can ask a question at this point or not. Yes, yes, yes. Go yes. ahead, please. Okay, good evening. Um, my name is uh, Ibrahim Endure, and um, my community is High Bridge and also around the towers that caught fire. And in fact, I am from Gambia, you know, where, you know, we lost those people. Um, and this is for FDNY. My question is for FDNY. Uh, they are asking what my community is asking. Um, it's what order heating system would would the FDNY recommend 
for them to use, um, you know, because the lack of it is it's something that is um, consistent, that is always happening in this building. So they are asking, other than space heater, what other um, uh, heaters do you recommend that they can they can buy? You know, you know, to keep themselves warm because the landlords are just not providing them heat apart from heat space heater. So just to clarify, sorry, and, I, and, I, and just to make sure that we got the question correct, you're you're asking what type of space heaters we would recommend, correct? Yeah, what type of heaters other than space heaters? Because space space heaters are very dangerous, you know. And there was an incident about nine years ago um, on uh, Woody Crest that was space heater. This one too, it was space heater. So they asking, what you know, are there any other heaters in the market that are safe for them to use? So that's what the question is. Uh, there's no other space heaters that we are aware of. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the kerosene and propane space heaters are illegal. Uh, there's really no other way, uh, safe way to heat your home other than to obviously go to the owners and uh, request that the heat be increased. Um, but other than that, no, the space heater is the uh, only thing that I'm aware of myself. Right, the electrical space heater. In terms of the brand, I don't think necessarily we, we could provide any specific brand on, on as a department. I mean, I think it's more along the lines of the safety, making sure that it is tested and qualified by ensuring that it has a tested um, uh, denotation as a UL or ETL, basically a qualified laboratory. Um, the captain's going to hold up just as an example. If it has the UL stamp or the UL marking, that means that it's been tested. So any space heater that has that means that it's been tested and recognized as a functional device. Essentially, those were the, would be the type of devices that we re recommend. But again, that's all with precaution. Again, uh, following the safety tips that were mentioned earlier, you know, of ensuring that a tested and qualified space heater is plugged in directly to an outlet and not into an extension cord or 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 or, 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 um, or power strip. Exactly. Uh, can can you put that on the on the chat? Please. Yeah, we, we could definitely do that. I'll I'll have the captain. I'll switch sheets real quick. He could he could type it in. But definitely, we we could put that in the chat. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. There's a question in the chat. Who do you call if the landlord won't install uh, install door knob covers on the stove upon request? So I think with co-ops. Uh, I think just because they're privately owned and correct me, I, I believe co-ops as they're privately owned, it is responsibility. I think it's different from a rental unit uh, where it's the landlord's responsibility to provide. I, again, I'd have to check up on that, but I believe with co-ops, it would be the responsibility of the owner to really put or purchase the, uh, the stove knob cover stuff that we would definitely recommend again, just because of the dangers with children um, or, 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 or just accidents. When turning when turning on the stove, so I'm going to agree with that. Just uh, only because I I live in a co-op myself, and uh, the thought is that you are in in fact an owner in the co-op uh, itself. So you you own shares in the property from I know from my my co-op itself. So technically you're considered an owner in there. So uh, usually you're looking at that for rental. Uh, properties where they're going to, the owner itself will be responsible to provide those covers for you. Another question, could there be periodic programs to make folks in NYCHA building aware of the need to have working smoke detectors? So there is an ongoing effort again between the uh, FDNY and Red Cross. Actually within the last year we've worked and we are working with NYCHA right now with the resident engagement division and also with the Department of Youth and Community Development, working through their cornerstone programs of basically targeting every development in the city. Now, again, a lot of developments in the city, but we are making an effort not only in person and virtually, but at the same time, providing information that can be disseminated electronically. Um, as shared in the website, we do have FDNYsmart.org, and I know the Red Cross also has uh, content as well that can be disseminated. <coughs> Uh, electronically, that's that's uh, within uh, or the, that is translated in different languages. Uh, but again, we are working with NYCHA ultimately to not only focus on the importance 
of maintaining and upkeeping smoke and CO alarms, but also about all the other key safety tips, which is talking about um, escape planning, knowing your building, um, and basically all the key res uh, key safety tips that we, we highlighted this evening. Again, but one uh, I would add, if there's a specific tenant group or an, a resident association leader that would like us to come, we quite frequently work with TA leaders to come to annual or, or annual to monthly presentations. So apologies um, to basically provide <coughs> any requests we will accommodate and we will ensure that we get that done. Because again, as a community, we rely heavily not only on the outreach that's conducted, but on the requests and the passing of the information basically to ensure that we're getting connected and providing that first line of education. I think you'd agree, Jason, right? Yeah, you know, it's it's ironic. I was just going to talk about that because I, I just saw a, a question from Bishop Joe uh, regarding how can we collaborate to get the word out? Guys, this is the, this is the, the hang up we have. The hang up we have, and I'm saying we meaning FDNY Red Cross, is getting the word to the community. We're doing the best we can. FDNY literally has guys on the blocks, on the corners, sometimes with a table, giving education, giving information out. Uh, we're trying to reach people as best as we can through outreach, through volunteers, through, through uh, talking to, 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 to community partners. The help we need from you is to spread the word. We give you the links, the, uh, you know, you can email, uh, 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 is gonna give you the, the email address for FDNY in a second, but you can email me, jason.lines at redcross.org, instead of emailing the, the link that I sent you. You can go to that website and request an alarm. The, the, we need to spread the word out there um, as best as we can. So we need your help. That's why we, we you can be very instrumental in reaching your community. Uh, the the faith-based organizations are, are institutions that the entire community come to. If you can say to spread the word out, out there for us to, hey, this is something that you need to do. You need to have smoke alarms in your home. You need to have this. Or if you can just connect us to come to your faith-based organization, come to your, your, your mosque, come to your church, come to your school and share the word, we would love to do it. We just need that connection. So you're all connect. As, they, as the young people say, you're all link up, link us up so that we can get the word out there to the community. That's what we want you to do for us today, right? Um, Jason, I yes. just wanna add though, just to reiterate, we are going to provide a comprehensive package. Again, I'm going to, we're going to talk offline with, with the Red Cross just to make sure that we're hitting one email with all the information that we discussed today, but we're going to provide guidance. Cause again, the message that we want to convey is that you're not in this alone. When we talk about emergency preparedness and fire safety education, it's a collaborative effort working with the 2 agencies, but with the greater community that we serve. And what I mean by that is tonight or after tonight, we are going to provide a comprehensive package. And in today's day and age, it's going to basically not only include how to engage post this event with presentations and live trainings, but how you can basically spread messages either through the social media feeds, uh, through uh, through set times that you speak with uh, community residents or congregants, parishioners, whatever it be, we are going to provide the language and the messaging and when we would recommend to basically highlight that. In addition, different content that you can help us spread with the guidance of like when typically we would recommend it. So as you know, as an example, we talked about daylight savings time during those two dates, probably like weeks or months leading or the month leading up, we're going to recommend, hey, remind people to change your to, to test their smoke alarms to ensure that smoke alarms are working properly when you change your clock for daylight savings. We're going to provide those items and that guidance after this event. So in ensuring to Jason's point and what we've been saying throughout the evening. That this is going to be a collaborative effort moving forward. We can't do this alone. We really need the support of our community. I would say, just in the interest of time, because I, I, I know it's it's getting a little late. If we want, we could take two more questions. Um, in the chat, I think there was one regarding um, uh, devices for for hearing and uh, for hearing impaired. Correct. Answer. Okay. The, the captain just said he answered another thing, and just in the event. Um, are there any questions outside of what's been, if there hasn't been anything answered in the chat, I guess, if anybody wants to raise their hand or. Yes, I, I, I'm sorry again, uh, Mr. Kozo and, uh, uh, Red Cross. Uh, I know you, you, uh, emphasize, you know, reaching out to CBOs and, and, and coming to masjids, 
uh, about the masjids. I know it's a lot of imams present uh, present uh, in this uh, uh, Webex. Uh, what I uh, my experience is this: what, one of the most effective ways to to to, reach, to connect with the mosque and get the information will be usually like um, right after the Friday congregation prayer when everybody is there because some of the community too you know you will you will do an event um the 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 the, the turnout rate will be will be real low because they're busy they are schedules this and that so i think a good strategy to, to connect with the masjid is to request for time right after the friday congregation when the whole community is there men women children and stuff like that and it will be um very it will be um like 30 minutes presentation and and i i i, I promise you that 30 minute presentation you you you're talking to the entire community instead of picking a special date to go to the mosque and stuff like that when members are not around and stuff like that so that's just what i want to put in the plan me personally i will talk with my imam i'm from the hybrid islamic center uh, I will talk with my imam there and and uh, and ask that you you uh, FDNY Red Cross um, come right after the Juma and do a presentation about fire because this is this is a real big issue in our community. Uh, fire prevention. We appreciate that recommendation and and I gotta say I, I much love for Highbridge as well and and I see that, that you're representing Highbridge. My uh, my family is from Highbridge and grew up in Highbridge, so I, I, I have an affinity toward the neighborhood. But um, uh, definitely the recommendation we will take, I did write it down. I know the Red Cross wrote it down as well. Um, and we will follow up on that. We'll make sure that, that that's a great point. If it, that's the best key point to working um, specifically on the congregations after the Friday uh, prayer, uh, we can definitely then yeah. at that point work on, on establishing some level of outreach at that point. And if you do want us to come, um definitely we could we could talk <coughs> offline or just email me i put the community affairs email and we could definitely then connect at that point okay thank you sir. thank you um may i add something to what the brother just said yes okay my name is uh imam shuaib from tajul huda and um just since we have the fire we try to uh, bring in some of your officers to our mercy to educate us, just like what the brother said, just immediately after the congregation, after the sermon. But till now, we didn't receive anything. Just, uh, just uh, what you are doing now, that's what we, we have. And what I would suggest is that uh, we have so many fire stations almost on every zip code. If you could uh, uh, send a circular message to them that uh, maybe their neighbors must massage it, like must mosque and uh, churches or synagogues may come to them and ask them to come and make a presentation from those that maybe you must have trained. That would be more, more, more effective because I got frustrated when I told my congregation that in the next two weeks we are going to bring somebody from the fire department to come and give us a lecture or educate us about how to best handle the the fire that's really um till now we are not getting it i became just like a liar but at the same time maybe my channel was not the right channel i spoke to the gentleman that's supposed to contact you they say they were not able to secure anybody to come to our masjid so i'm suggesting if uh, you could now spread this to all your branches so that's any masjid around or any church around any synagogue and go to the nearest and say okay we want somebody from to come from your place to come and uh, give them those lectures i think that would be effective too thank you so imam thank you for that that that, that recommendation um in terms of i guess maybe that's how we could talk offline if 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 what i'll do is i'll put my my contact number in there and uh an email as well Directly, our office is responsible for coordinating. If we if we can uh, schedule something, we could definitely make that happen. In terms of getting the message out, 
we are going to basically put that out there in terms of uh yeah please do because yeah. uh really i became a liar i need it as as soon as possible because i told them i keep on telling them and i told them i was not able to secure it yet no, no worries Imam. what i will do is um let me i'm gonna put it in my chat if you want we could talk either after this presentation and I can get the information, I can make sure that we get a team out there. Uh, okay. But in terms of the grander recommendation of making it more publicly, we can definitely work through the different channels of, of basically uh, ensuring that that messaging gets out there of both FDNY and Red Cross presentations. Thank you very much. I, um, on the, one of the last things I want to say, guys, before we, we leave, and um, Imam, thank you. And I had a question before. Sure, go ahead. Go ahead. So um, I have submitted a request um, online for a presentation at my church and also in my um, uh, buildings. But I am requesting, or my question is, um, my request is for a uh, virtual presentation as you're doing now, not for an in-person presentation. So, uh, so for both, uh, and I, I'll speak for FDNY and Wine, Jason, if you wanna talk about um, Red Cross, but I think uh, coincidentally, both organizations do it, but we do offer both. So as we're doing today virtual, we have the capacity to do so. So we can offer both in-person or virtual depending on the need you know, given that we are still going through the pandemic and understanding, you know, being able to convene in person uh, may be of concern. Again, we can offer both. So either through FDNY, through the FDNYsmart.org or through contacting community affairs, definitely for fire safety presentations, we can definitely assist in that. Jason, I, I think the same can be said about Red Cross, correct? That's exactly correct. Yeah, you can uh, reach out to us and we will definitely would love to come out there to, to facilitate a session okay. virtually, be there virtually with your with your uh audience okay can you do virtual on sunday afternoons like at about we work three? when you are available so any day anytime we have someone ready to serve you thank you same same could be said here i mean again the only thing that we would say is just advanced planning um again because just with with uh with requests coming in you know again we just want to make sure that we're fitting it in the schedule but if you put in the request and we are able to find the date and time we will work around in terms of scheduling. Thank you very much. We'll take one more question just because of the interest of time. I think there's can a, a, can, a, can a fire extinguisher be recharged and should we go out and buy one that services the A, B, and C? So they can be recharged. Is it worth having one that you're going to be using in your home get recharged? Probably not. Uh, you're typically looking at a three to five pound extinguisher in your home. And it's probably going to cost more to have somebody recharge it than it is to just buy a new one. So what you would want to do is recycle it, bring it back to where you got it or where you're going to get a new one. Uh, they'll take it and then you would just buy a new one. Uh, if you use it one time, you want to get rid of it. Uh, you can recycle them yourselves. There's a little bit of a, uh, you know, a method to it. Um, as far as emptying it and then recycling it, you don't want to just throw it in the garbage when it's still pressurized. Uh, you want to make sure that you are depressurizing it first uh, before you get rid of it. So, yeah, the short answer is it's really not worth having them recharged. And, and, and ABC, should, should it be, should we, should we go out and get one that's ABC if we don't have that one already? For your home, I would have an ABC one in your home. Uh, it's good for typically just about any fire you're going to see in your home. We, we honestly recommend that you have one near the kitchen or just outside the kitchen. We also recommend having one in your bedroom. Uh, should you wake up in the middle of the night, you may have a little bit of fire that's blocking you from getting to your exit. If you have an extinguisher in your bedroom, you're able to use that extinguisher, maybe to knock down just enough fire where you can get out safely. So it is a good idea to have one in the bedroom as well. One more question. I think we just have one more and then so it's a wrap of the evening. I think there is someone with their hand up. If I had a penny for every time he said one more question, I'd be rich by now. <laughs> God be it's, it's, a lot of wealth, it's a wealth of information everyone I, and apologies i just i want to, to answer it and, and vehicle for 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 knowledge so one one more question apologies yeah angel martinez i think you had your hand up for quite a while 
Okay, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to all the firemen who risk their lives every day. Um, I'm a community board member of Bronx Community Board Number Nine. Me personally, I was involved in a fire two weeks ago. It wasn't in the Bronx, it was in Long Island, but it was severe. Had a gas dryer caught on fire, and the firemen came out, and I did my best to try to put the fire away, but everything I heard today, I see the smell smoke and ran away. And um, I thank you guys. And I say one thing is that we understand that we tell our kids don't play with fire, you get burnt. But we need to take responsibility and spread the message to our neighbors. Because like where I come from, born here in the Bronx Bill Projects, each one teach one. We need to tell each other we can save a life. And we need to take responsibility on not just putting it on one person, it's all our responsibility. And that's my, my only message, because I thank God that, you know what, I'm still here two weeks later, my son's birthday today, I, you know, was with him. And I just say that, you know what, thank you guys. And I made sure to be part of this tonight, even though I've been working since five o'clock in the morning, and, but I wanted to just to get this message across and thank God I, I got this message across, because I wasn't gonna say nothing, but I just wanted to make sure that we don't just put it all on American Red Cross or the fire department. It's all our responsibility, society's responsibility to make sure that we take care of each other. Thank you guys and God bless. Thank you. You all have my time. So, so with that said, um, one more question. No, no, more, no, no more. <laughs> um, with that said, uh, we do want to- I did have one, but I'll, 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 I'll throw it in somewhere else. <laughs> I just want to say thank you for everyone uh, participating this evening. Uh, first and foremost, thank you uh, to the Bronx Police President Vanessa L. Gibson and her team uh, for arranging this. Um, I think these types of forums definitely we do need to continue this dialogue. As we mentioned, we are going to be sending in, in, in days to come um, information to all those who registered and all those who participated, just so that this uh, effort of, of of strengthening fire and emergency preparedness outreach continues. Um, and not only for, uh, to protect the residents of the Bronx, but citywide as well. Um, thank you to the Bronx Clergy Task Force. I think with the, our faith-based leader and our faith-based community, um, it's an ultimate vehicle that everyone needs to tap into, not only for spirituality, but at the same time to use it as a way to convene for knowledge like this of fire safety education and emergency preparedness. So thank you to the Bronx Clergy Task Force. Um, again, uh, please stay connected on social media at FDNY, uh, on the website, www.fdnysmart.org, and through the different channels that the American Red Cross brought forth this evening. Uh, again, be safe, be well, and please be FDNY smart and help us spread this message. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.